Hi, I'm Paul Jay. Welcome to the analysis.news. In a few seconds, I'll be back with Larry Wilkerson to talk about the current and very dangerous situation in the Russian Ukrainian war. Please join me, and please also don't forget this is only possible because of donations from people like you. And the donate button's best to just come over to the website and now at theanalysis.news or .com works too. And hit the donate button and also get on our email list. It's critical that we have a direct way of communicating with you because if you are mostly a YouTube viewer, uh, you may not, you may not, never know whether you're going to get messages or communication from us given the way YouTube has treated us. Uh, be back in just a few seconds. Hu Xin is the former editor-in-chief of Global Times. Global Times is an uh, online paper that's essentially an English publication that's an extension of People's Daily, which essentially is the publication of the Chinese Communist Party. This is an important role, meaning a fairly senior role in the Chinese Communist Party, at the very least a direct line to the CCP propaganda leadership. So here's what he wrote in a recent opinion piece in Global Times. To some extent, it must reflect the thinking of the party leadership, uh, or at the very least, an important opinion within party leadership. It's not nece necessarily monolithic. Uh, here's an excerpt from that article. Shortly after the breakout of the Ukraine war, some Western analysts cautioned not to push Putin and Russia into a dead end. In, this, in brackets, this is me talking. I would include uh, Larry Wilkerson in, in those pundits. Uh, he'll be joining us soon. Here, here I go back to the article. Pushing Russia into a dead end because Russia is a nuclear power. This view may be unpopular in Western politics, but it does reflect a kind of rationality. Just imagine when Putin and Russian soldiers believe that losing the war may lead to a collapse of the government, that means the Russian government, and a purge on them. That means, this is me adding that that means, Putin and the people around him, in which their lives cannot be guaranteed. In other words, this is me again, the possibility of a violent coup in Moscow. I continue, when the Russian people believe that defeat in the war means that their country would disintegrate again and there would be serious fighting surrounding the new regime. They will take the Ukraine war as a new great patriotic war to fight it to the end. He goes on a little further down. The Ukrainian armed forces equipped by the West have become stronger but their counteroffensive doesn't mean they can reshape the outcome of the war. When the war turns to a life and death struggle, if the West wants to win the final victory, it needs to transcend the confidence and strength that nuclear weapons have given Russia. Let me read that again. If the West wants to win the final victory, which I assume means the downfall of Putin, Back to reading what he wrote. It needs to transcend the confidence and strength that nuclear weapons have given Russia. This is me again, meaning don't fear this use of tactical nuclear weapons and continue to push this until Putin falls. Back to the article. Undoubtedly, in terms of morality and the actual interests of mankind, the Russia-Ukraine conflict should not be escalated into nuclear war at any point. That would open a Pandora's box and would inevitably lead to a series of unimaginable consequences. An emergency break needs to be put on the situation in Ukraine at a time when the scale of the war is still manageable. There needs to be a ceasefire and negotiations rather than an ever-increasing showdown between Russia and NATO. Please don't forget that there will be no absolute winner or loser in a military conflict between nuclear powers. Whoever tries to completely overwhelm the other side must be crazy. 
I don't know if this is President Xi speaking or an opinion within the party, but it certainly is a message to President Biden and others. Be careful what you wish for. This comes at a time when President Putin has called up 300,000 reserves, called for a referendum that would lead to Russia annexing Donbass, and again hinted at the possible use of tactical nuclear weapons if the situation threatens Russian sovereignty. Now joining us is Larry Wilkerson, former Chief of Staff to Secretary of State Colin Powell. Thanks for joining us again, Larry. Good to be with you, Paul. So, Larry, what do you, what do you make of that opinion piece from Global Times? I think it's uh, a, an aspect, as you pointed out, of the Politburo's propaganda, but sometimes propaganda needs to be listened to. Uh, in this case, I think that's the case. It needs to be listened to because it happens to be accurate, I think, as far as it goes. Um, and, and let me just add that the challenge right now is that Zelensky and Biden and other NATO leaders, and let me tell you right now that these NATO leaders do not represent their people. They do not. They're a group of leaders whom we have put in place over the last 20 years who do our bidding, more or less, including Jan Stoltenberg, the, the, the Secretary General of NATO. These are people who don't necessarily f reflect the majority opinion in France, in Germany, in Sweden, in Denmark, in Finland, or any place else, really. Check out Slovakia's leaders lately, who have been speaking truth about the things that are going on that they don't like. Uh, for example, the extension of this war. And people understand that this war is being extended because the West is making money. Who's making money? Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, Grumman, you name it. These people are making money and they're influencing the White House to keep the war going. They're influencing the Congress, which is influencing the White House to keep the war going. And then you've got people like Graham from South Carolina, my state, who really hate Russia and want to do something to Russia. And there are other people in the Congress like that too. They're, they're dumb. They truly are dumb. This is a serious war in the heart of Europe that needs to stop yesterday. And the Pope's right. Making money off of it is not a reason to keep it going. And on the other hand, bringing Putin down, which is some of these neoconservatives in particular objective, like John Bolton, is not viable either. But for the very reasons that the Global Times piece you quoted points out, plus more, you do not want this war to lead to the collapse of Russia. And that's what we're looking at. That's what some people want in addition to the money making. And you put that together and Pope Francis is absolutely correct to excoriate the West, NATO, Washington, London, Berlin, the whole group of us, because it should stop. And the only way you get it to stop is you have a lose-lose situation, if you will. If you want to put a positive turn on it, call it win-win. That is to say, we give up some stuff and eat a little crow, and Putin gives up some stuff and eats a little crow, and we meet in the middle and we stop this dying conflict. Uh, it's nonsense that Putin covets Lithuania or Estonia or whatever. He is doing what anyone would do, I think, realistically, strategically, given what we've done with NATO and what Ukraine presented to him as a potential threat. Now, I'm not excusing him. I'm not, I, I don't like him at all. I mean, he's a he's an autocrat. He's a dictator. He he gets worse every day. But let's face it, you have you sometimes have to deal with these kind of people in order to stop something that's going to be a lot worse than Putin being the dictator, and that's a nuclear war. So we need to negotiate. We need to sit down. We need to talk. We need to end this conflict. But we're not going to do it because of all these influences in all the Western capitals that seem to think we should keep it going. And let me repeat, they do not represent their people. And when winter comes, we will find that out big time. When uh, you, I talk to Ukrainians, including Ukrainians that actually supported the idea of neutrality before the invasion, uh, who were against Ukraine, thought Ukraine should declare they won't join NATO, um, who are very, very critical of the Ukrainian oligarchy uh, and have been organizing in Ukraine against the Ukrainian oligarchy prior to the invasion. 
the, those of them, and I have no idea how broad this represents the Ukrainian left, they do not want an end in a way that ends with Russia controlling Donbass and, and perhaps even some other sections of Ukraine, Eastern Ukraine. Um, and, and they say, you know, too many Ukrainians have died fighting this criminal and brutal invasion. And I think it is a criminal and brutal invasion. And I don't in any way disagree with everything you said up until this point. I agree with everything you said. And, and, and I, some of my Ukrainian people, I've, not mine, people I've, I was going to say my friends, but they're not my friends. I just know them because I interviewed them. Uh, uh, I think very much underestimate the role of NATO and the Americans in helping provoke and instigate this. But I also, but I also agree with Boris Kargalitsky and others and other Russians I've talked to that this really was Putin's agenda, Putin's decision, Putin's miscalculation, and there was no need for this invasion whatsoever. And and and, and the, anyway, all that being all that being said. When we're talking about how to resolve this and negotiate this, you can't leave the Ukrainians out of this. And so far, I'm not sure the Ukrainians want to negotiate this in a way that leaves Russia in control of a significant part of Ukraine. I'm not willing to sacrifice the world for Ukraine, and I'm not willing to sacrifice the world for those people you just talked about. Now, I understand when you've been attacked, when your family's been threatened, when your cities have been bombed, when your streets are full of enemy tanks, when artillery rounds are falling on you, when rockets are hitting you, you are going to change your mind. You're not going to be a peacenik, as it were, not the normal person anyway. I understand their feelings, but I'm not going to sacrifice Europe and certainly not the world for them. It's that simple. So let's get to the table and let's talk. And I don't give a hang. If you don't want to give up some of your country, turn around and look at Poland. Poland's been marched over by armies for God knows centuries and lost this and lost that. Everybody in that part of Europe has been marched over. You know, Father Arpad of the Hungarians, they have a joke in Budapest. It's he should have kept going to the English Channel and not stopped where he did because Hungary is in such an untenable geographic position. Well, they're all in untenable geographic positions. I'm sorry, you live there. And the rest of the world does not need to sacrifice its existence because of you. So get to the negotiating table, start talking, and get some kind of deal. Get the best deal you can. But you are not going to get Crimea back. I'll bet you on that. You might get the Eastern... Donbass, or, or the Eastern Oblast back. Um, you might be able to achieve some sort of integrity as Ukraine looks like without Crimea. But other than that, you're probably going to have to sacrifice a little bit and uh, realize that Putin's going to be sacrificing in terms of his wishes something too, not least of which is he started this brutal war, got all these Russians killed, and doesn't have a whole lot to show for it. Well, that's actually what I said to my quote unquote Ukrainian friends. I said the same thing. I said, what, you, you know, are you fighting and dying? Even if you win the way things are, you're going to hand Ukraine back to the Ukrainian oligarchs. And thousands and thousands of people are going to die to defend that kind of sovereignty. Makes no sense to me. So make your deal. And if the people in Donbass don't want to be part of Russia, you know, even if the referendum that's coming is a crock and, and the pro-Russian forces win, well, then the people of Donbass can organize against Russia and keep on, you know, wage their own kind of fight. But tens of thousands more people don't have to die and we don't have to risk uh, a world global annihilation because I think this, this, what you just said and also the quote from the Global Times guy, I, I think it's, this is very possible that... That I, mean, I thought the key, one of the most important things he says, like, and imagine if Putin does think his re government regime is, I think he used the word regime, is going to fall, then his life could be at risk. And, you know, anything's possible. Why on earth would anyone want to corner him that way? Absolutely. And, and let's look at the military situation again, too. I, I keep pointing this out to my 
general officer friends who are part of the mega media propaganda machine in the West. Most of them getting paid too from that media to do that. Um, and I, you, you know, someone said to me today, look, look what the Ukrainians have done. Look, well, they walked over several miles of empty territory really, but look what they've done. And the Russians are now on the defensive. They're on the defensive, completely on the defensive. I said, yes, and he's calling up 300,000 more. You know what Russia did to Germany on the defensive? Do you know what Russia did to Napoleon on the defensive? This is Russia's strength. If he thinks he's going to cross that border and actually bring harm to Russia, he is going to be engulfed and beaten to a pulp. So where are we going from here? It's nonsense. Yeah, I mean, I, I read accounts of what's going on on the ground. You know, the Ukrainians are doing really well. The Ukrainians aren't doing as well as Western media says they are. Uh, I have no idea what the hell's going on on the ground. And in some ways, in terms of what we pr just talked about, it doesn't matter. Uh, there is, you know, th this is not going to end in a complete Russian defeat in Donbass. If it does, then we're probably into a more dangerous situation and it's actually worse. So make the damn deal, which means in terms of U.S. policy, what? What is so Biden says, OK, I, I'm listening to this interview with you and that that crazy person, Paul Jay, and uh, I can't tell anyone I'm talking to Wilkerson because they'll think I'm out of my mind. But Larry, so what the hell are you actually saying I should do here? Secretary of State Blinken, I'm going to give you a directive. You are to go meet with Sergey Lavrov. Whatever you have to do to convince him that you are, you are sincere, do it. Whatever you have to do to convince him that you speak directly for me, do it. Whatever you have to do to convince him to meet in Geneva or in Timbuktu, do it. And let's do it within 48 to 96 hours. Let's have our negotiating team sitting down with his negotiating team. The Ukrainians can be observers if they want to. Other members of NATO can be observers if they want to. And we're going to have a direct talks and we're going to end this conflict now. How, how, how can you do it without the Ukrainians there as a full participant? Easy, because they aren't going to be anything without you. And if they haven't figured that out by now, they aren't going to wage one more second of effective warfare without us. They simply aren't. You've got real leverage, just like we've had leverage over the Israelis for years and years and years and never used it. Here, we need to loot to use the leverage that we have. And if anybody objects in a serious way, we need to threaten to leave. We need to really bring some exquisite, as I call it, diplomacy to these talks. Not only the talks that result with the Russians, but the talks with all the people we have led into this mess. Well, I agree with you on most of this, but I wouldn't agree on that. I, I think the Ukrainians have to be at the table. And, but I can't imagine how they wouldn't be if the, if the Americans were serious about saying, you come to the table and make a deal that's you know within reason or the arms. Uh, they would eventually be there, of course. But you're not going to sit down with Sergei now. You're not going to sit down with him and some some Ukrainian. You're going to I don't care who it is. Zelensky could sit there. You need to talk, Tony, with Sergey and Sergey needs to talk to you. And you need to come away from this one on one hour, two hours, three hours. Russians like to talk, so it'd probably be four or five hours <laughs> conversation with both of you, at least trusting that what you have said is achievable. Then you bring the other people in to complicate the discussion. And what do you think that looks like then? What, what do they come away with? You know, where is there a possible agreement? What does it look like? I, I think it's Ukrainian territorial integrity with the exception of the question, perhaps of a portion that is most Russian of the eastern region that then would be under some sort of independently monitored the OSCE the United States, I mean, whoever might do it, that do, would do it best and be accepted by all parties, a referendum. And the referendum is to, you know, what do they want to do? What do they want to be? And you get in the negotiated deal that both sides, all sides, will accept the results of that referendum. 
especially if the United States and the OSCE or whomever attest to its fairness and its validity. Um, and that's how you settle that particular region. But everything else is done deal. Just, just, let's just quickly, the OSCE, I believe, has like about 50 or 60 countries that have representatives. This is a quite a multilateral thing, of the, essentially of the United Nations. In theory, is not controlled by either the Americans or Russians or anybody else. As a matter of fact, they have a reputation of pissing us off. <laughs> and when you do this, you have to have in mind the aftermath and what you're trying to achieve. And by aftermath, I mean Russia has to be as it is geographically. Rand McNally maps show it part of Europe. They are a part of Europe, certainly from the Urals in. Now, I think they're a part of Europe and have aspired to be a part of Europe for centuries from Moscow all the way and and even further than that now you could say well vladivostok is not a part of europe okay i'll buy that they are they are multi parts the part is more asian than it is european and vice versa but that part of russia which has always longed and yearned from the czar's time on to be a part of europe i mean they spoke french at catherine's court um that needs to be recognized and they need to be brought into Europe. Well, they they were used to intermarry with Europe aristocracy all the time. Yes, and it needs to be a successful attempt this time. Uh, we tried in the early 90s. I was listening to Clinton interviewed by Zalmi, uh, not Zalmi, uh, Fareed. He was being interviewed by Fareed the other day. And I'm listening to this guy talking about what he did. Very articulate, very, very he was into it he was very very studied and analytical which is not like bill clinton but he was and what he said was very persuasive but what he said was an angle that was wrong because he was defending his expansion of nato and he was giving excuses that made the russians guilty he was saying things like we offered them nato membership we offered them all manner of participation in the alliance. We offered them all manner of economic participation. So member of the EU, oh, bullshit, Mr. President. <laughs> you might have whispered in somebody's ear that you were going to do that, but you've never whispered in a Russian ear. And any Russian will tell you that. And if Yeltsin was the one he was whispering into the ear of, that's like whispering at a goose. I mean, Yeltsin was drunk 90% of the time. One of the reasons that uh, so much happened on his watch that was negative for Russia. But you, you, you need to get out of this attitude that Russia needs to be an internal enemy of Europe. It is a part of Europe. How can you have a stable, economically successful? And look at the EU now. The EU is 740, 750 billion people with the GDP, the equivalent of ours but they can't get their political act together. That's part of why we're doing this too. We don't want that GDP that's the equivalent of ours to be competitive with us. We want to be hegemonic with respect to it. And so we don't want this to happen. And that's why we've seen all this mess in part over the last few years. That's why H.W. Bush and Colin Powell and Jim Baker started out with this attitude and then it got morphed into, oh no, we can't make peace with Russia because what if we make peace with Russia and they really do become a part of Europe and we add another 150 million people to that 740 million and we add Russia's gas and oil to that trillion dollar already, what, 18, 19 trillion dollar GDP. Well, also nuclear weapons. Yeah, and nuclear weapons too. I mean, this is not what the what Washington wants in terms of the people who think about these sorts of things in these in these ways, which are only a few who yeah. think who think we have no empathy, Paul. We cannot empathize with Tehran. We cannot empathize with Havana. We cannot empathize with Moscow. We don't know how to empathize. We cannot put ourselves in other people's shoes and say, OK, now I'm sitting here. How do I feel about this? How do I feel about a president going to Tbilisi and announcing to all and sundry in public that Georgia will be a member of NATO? Well, let me let me just add to that just a, 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 a new a nuance, which is this. First of all, the American state is a rogue state. 
international law means absolutely nothing unless it serves the particular context to start worrying about international law. Uh, Bush and Cheney should have been, uh, well, you and I have talked about this because you were there then, you know, they should have been uh, charged with war crimes. Obama actually, uh, by not charging them with war crimes, actually committed one. My understanding, Obama had a responsibility under international law to prosecute Bush and Cheney. All that being said, it doesn't mean that this Russian state isn't also another rogue state, and 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 to a large extent because of what the way Russia's been treated. I mean, Hitler rose to some extent, large extent, because of the Versailles Treaty and the way Germany was humiliated. So even if it's true that not only is the U.S. essentially a rogue state and Russia is a rogue state now. We have to live with that, and we have to demand that these two states had better not blow up the world. I agree. That's the reason I say find a neutral city and sit down. We, we have to end this conflict. And there's another reason we need You know what I'm going to say. We have to end this conflict because we have two other challenges that are staring us in the face like a roaring freight train. The first one, no nuclear arms control no treaties, not even a conventional forces in Europe treaty anymore. We have abandoned all arms control. And the second, of course, is what's coming at us with regard to the changing climate. We need to focus on these two threats. We need to focus badly. We needed to yesterday, 15, 20 years ago. It, they're going to eat our lunch if we don't. And here we are frittering away money and lives and power in Ukraine. It just doesn't make any sense. Well, the only sense it makes is the as you started this interview with the money being made by, you know, gun manufacturers. You know, I, I did an interview with Boris Kargalitsky. We talked about a lot of things. But one of the things we talked about is the extent to which Russia is being savaged by climate change already. Yes. And, I mean, and it's it's a it's a, a fundamental existential threat to the entire uh, Russian society, economy, it's already uh, in a fairly advanced state in certain areas like Siberia and, and others. The methane release in Siberia and Alaska. Now. Yeah. I mean, and, and so, you know, a grand deal here to save humanity is so necessary, so obvious, but the fossil fuel companies and the arms manufacturers would rather play this out even though it leads to an app, a complete shit show. We are the we are the first human civilization in, as far as I know, five thousand years of history, perhaps all of human history, to have the technological know-how to save ourselves in a situation where we could be existentially threatened. But do we have the wisdom to do it? So far, the answer is no. Well, if people, you know, <laughs> I'm going to quote uh, Osama bin Laden, uh, which I don't normally do, but I thought he had one pretty good line in one of his, in his, he wrote this thing called A Letter to Americans, which doesn't get quoted very much. You know, in it, he says, he says, we, you say we fight you because we hate your freedom and democracy. He says, if that was true, we would have attacked Sweden. Uh, the, the, and he had another line, which he said, you know, you Americans, you vote for these policies. So you're not innocents in this picture. That's, that's one of the things my, my few Iranian colleagues who still talk to me uh, are constantly saying, we don't hate the American people, we hate your government. And I look back at them and I say, our government is the people. Well, that's further than I would go. I think the situation is so, yeah, but it is so manipulated. But that said, uh, these coming elections in 2022 and 2024, uh, people better understand that as bad as the Biden uh, foreign policy is and, and at the extent to which many of the neocons are now actually that used to be in the Republican Party are now in the in the Democratic Party and, and have a lot to say about uh, U.S. foreign policy. Uh, the Christian nationalists could wind up controlling uh, the House, maybe the Senate. They seem to already have a majority on the Supreme Court. And then if they get a president in 2024, uh, it, it's, it's, I think, more dangerous. 
so these elections are very critical and people better avoid sort of sectarian positions here. Uh, it's a complicated balance because it's, you know, these Biden forces, very dangerous and playing with fire in Ukraine and Taiwan. You know, if, you, uh, if you go back and look at the arguments that people and, and look at the literature, look at look at the literature that came out of that region of Europe, but particularly Germany at that time, and, and particularly from Jewish writers, actually, playwrights and others. Um, and, and you see the arguments that they had in 33 and 34 and 35 about what they could do with the Nazis if they, you know, if they gained real power, how they could neutralize them, how this party was this way, how the Reds were the Reds. But, you know, it, all this argument was for nothing because the man had the idea and he had the populace behind him once he expressed that idea in some really very hateful ways to be sure the persecution of the Jews being the most hateful of all. But he expressed them in ways that caught the attention of all those who were on the fence, as it were, and it turned out to be the majority of the German people. We're talking about Rick DeSantis coming in. Trump is not going to run. He may try to run, but he's not going to run. DeSantis is going to run. Yeah. And, and if he gets elected, he is much smarter than Trump. And what you're saying is very likely to come true. And we may indeed have a national religion, an armed force that protects that religion. We may have a religious test for uh, office. I mean, we've got representatives who are saying the Constitution needs to be rewritten in that regard. Um, and people just disregard that. So did the people in Germany. No, this can't happen. No, nah, never happened. Never happened. Um, it ha and, it, and it happened quickly. You know, you had a time when when Hitler is first elected as chancellor of Germany, if I get my history right, there was an enormous opposition to Hitler. There were workers in the streets. The workers' movement was almost at a height. And when the, in a matter of a very few years, there's a, an out-and-out -out, uh, fascist dictatorship. And I, I, you know, I, I, go ahead. You still have people, especially the old Prussian uh, aristocracy and that portion that was in the military in the Bermont, you still have people who are saying, oh, we can handle him. We can handle him, you know, right. as they right. sip their cognac and smoke their cigar. Well, let me end this with one chilling piece of documentary footage. Uh, people might have seen this, but I'm going to play it again anyway. Um, I think in, 19, in 1938 or 9, there was a rally of American, essentially fascists, at Madison Square Gardens. They filled the place like over 20,000 people um, doing an American style Z Kyle with a big picture of George Washington on the stage using the words make America great again, essentially. And here's that footage I mentioned. Uh, you can watch that uh, for a, a chilling ending of, for the interview.
undivided allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and the republic for which it stands, one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow Americans, American patriots, I'm sure I do not come before you tonight as a complete stranger. You all have heard of me through the Jewish controlled press as a creature with horns, a cloven hoof, and a long tail. We, with American ideals, demand that our government shall be returned to the American people who founded it. If you ask what we are actively fighting for under our charter, first, a social, just, white, Gentile who rules United States. Second, Gentile-controlled labor union, free from Jewish Moscow-directed domination. 